Hey, Victory, we are in our David series, and this is a series about the life and the lessons from the man David in the Bible. You might be asking, who is David and what does he have to do with my life? Well, David was a young kid in Israel that God chose to be the future king of Israel. In fact, the reason God chose him is because God said, this was a man after my own heart. Now, I don't know about you, but I wanna be a man after God's own heart. I believe God's called all of us, men and women, boys and girls, all ages, to be people after his own heart. Because when we're people after God's own heart, we set ourselves apart to be used by God in extraordinary ways. And if there's one thing we can learn about David is David was an ordinary kid. He didn't have any superhuman powers. He wasn't super strong or super tall. He didn't come from a wealthy family. He didn't grow up in the Ivy League schools of Israel. No, David was a shepherd boy. He smelled like sheep. He had a slingshot. He knew how to use his slingshot. So when David took on Goliath, the biggest giant that would defy the armies of Israel, David took him down, cut off his head, and he won the battle against the Philistines. From that day on, David could not walk around without being noticed. David was a household name in Israel. He was a legend, but he still wasn't the king yet. In fact, the guy who was king, who was the first king of Israel, his name was Saul. And when Saul saw David take Goliath out, Saul got really jealous and over time started throwing spears and trying to kill David, trying to kill the guy who saved his nation, who was helping Israel win. So David hid in the caves for many years and finally the day came where Saul died. And he didn't die at the hand of David because David would not try to throw spears back at Saul or take him down. David decided that's not my job. God anointed him to be king. And when God's done with him being king, God can end his kingdom and start when it's my time to step in. And sure enough, God honored the promise that he gave to David, but it would be 15 to 16 years later. And when David stepped in as king, everything started prospering. In fact, David captured the city Jerusalem and Jerusalem became the headquarters for Israel. And David began saving money up for a future temple that God had put in his heart to build for the presence, the Ark of the Covenant, the the very presence of God that they had been carrying for hundreds of years since they left Egypt. And then God used David to bless even Saul's family, the the family that tried to kill David. David blessed his, uh, his young nephew Mephibosheth, the son of John. Jonathan, David's best friend. So everything was going well for David. David was having the time of his life as king. He was winning all his battles. If there was ever a time for David to kick back and relax, it was right now. The only problem was he wasn't supposed to be relaxing. In fact, in a time when he was supposed to be fighting with his team and with his army, he opted to not show up to the battle. And we see in 2 Samuel 11, while David was such a great king of Israel, temptation was waiting to knock him out. The enemy did not like the hand of God on David's life. At the time where kings would go off to war in the springtime of Israel, when when Israel was fighting their battles, David opted to stay home and to relax on top of his palace. And one day when he was heading up to his palace to look over the kingdom as the sun was setting in Israel, he looked over the roof palaces and the rooftops of his palace in Israel and he saw Bathsheba. Now Bathsheba was a beautiful woman. The Bible says that when he saw her, she was taking a bath. David was so drawn to this woman, he couldn't look away. All of us in life will have distractions, things that try to tempt us, things that try to grab our attention away from our purpose. And here's the test. The test is what, it's not whether or not you notice it, because we'll all notice distractions, temptations, but it's if we allow ourselves to linger in that direction. Because the longer you look, the more you start to move in the wrong direction. And if you look a second time and a third time and a fourth time and a fifth time at something you're not supposed to have or someone you're not supposed to have, the easier it is to move in that direction and to crave it and to lust after it until you can get it. Think about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God wasn't mad if Adam and Eve noticed the tree that they weren't allowed to eat from. God said, just don't touch it. You might walk past it, you might see it, just don't touch it, it's not for you. God had given them everything else to have. But the longer that they looked at that forbidden fruit, the more that Eve was drawn to take it and then Adam to take a bite from it. And the same goes with David. It says in this chapter that David called for Bathsheba and they had sex and then from there, she sends a note to David and says, David, you're not gonna believe it, I'm pregnant. 
and I'm a married woman and my husband is fighting on the battlefields at war for Israel. Can you imagine just the pain inside of David, the shock, the sense of regret, the feelings of guilt and the feelings of all that, the, the, the uh, internal turmoil, like how am I gonna try to fix this situation? And that's exactly what David did. David tried to cover it all up. He sent Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, to the front lines on the middle of the battlefield. And then he sent word secretly to the commander of Israel, pull back and leave Uriah all by himself so that arrows and spears will be thrown and so that Uriah will fall. David, the king of Israel, would have the man who was fighting for him, the man who was serving and the man who was laying his life down for him to, to fight the battle, he would have that guy killed. And David would sleep with his wife. What a Saul thing to do. David was reverting back to the very things that he hated under King Saul. He was being a Saul in this moment and he thought he could get away with it. It says at the end of the chapter that David then, after Bathsheba found out that her husband had been killed on the battlefield, she cried and she wept and she mourned for many days for her husband's loss. And she felt the guilt knowing that she had become pregnant from another man who wasn't her husband and that somehow he was connected to her actual husband's death. Through all of that, David took Bathsheba in to become his wife and that the son that she bore him would become their child. And he thought, okay, it's all well now, but it ends with this last scripture. The thing that David had done broke God's heart. David thought nobody else will know about it. Nobody but me and Bathsheba, but God knew. And God would see if David would have the heart to repent and change, or if he would make the same mistake as Saul and keep going down a path of disobedience towards God. We'll see next what David did to respond to his sin. <laughs> So here we find David in a place of hiding, hiding from God, hiding his sin, trying to keep a cover over all of his mistakes. He had committed adultery, he had committed murder, and he thought he could get away with it. But it says at the end of 2 Samuel 11, God's heart was broken over David's sin. And so we see in 2 Samuel 12 that God sends David's pastor, Nathan. Now Nathan had built a relationship with David. They had hung out together. They had uh, become close friends and confidants. David trusted Nathan and he saw Nathan as really just his personal advisor and spiritual counselor. So in this moment, David's trying to hide his sin and who knows, maybe he greets David with a little hug or a fist bump. Hey, Pastor Nathan, great to see you. Missed you, man, how are things going? But for Nathan, there was no small talk. He went straight to the reason why he was there to talk with David. Nathan knew from God what David had done. He didn't have to hear about it from anybody else. He knew the sin that David was trying to hide. And Nathan spoke to David with the story. He said, David, let me tell you a story. Imagine with me for a moment, two men that lived in this town. One was really rich, one was really poor. And the rich man had thousands of sheep. He had tons of cattle and all the land that he wanted, all the food and wine. He was a wealthy, wealthy man, but the poor man, he had nothing. He had just his family and one little sheep. And this one little sheep he had spent all of his money to buy. And that little sheep grew up with his family and ate in the house and drank from the bowl and, 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 and was, was close to the family. And that man just loved his little sheep. And one day a traveler came through the town and stopped at the rich man's house and asked to have a meal. And the rich man looked across all of his cattle and his sheep and said, instead of picking one of mine, I'm gonna take that poor man's little sheep, the only sheep he has, and that will be our meal tonight. When Nathan told this story to David, David was trying to track with them. And finally, when he heard that party, he got excited, furious, angry. I can't believe that rich man would do that to that poor man. Who does such a thing? That rich man deserves to die. He deserves to pay for that. That is a mean thing to do. He had tons of sheep to choose from. Why would he take that poor man's little sheep? And Nathan looks at David and says, you are that man. 
David probably stepped back and hold, hold on, wait a minute. How am I that man? When did I take? And maybe in that moment when David was starting to respond to Nathan, he started to realize the depth of his sin, what he had done. And Nathan looks at David and said, David, God anointed you as king of Israel. He gave you everything you wanted. You've got all the cattle. You've got all the sheep. You've got tons of land. You have everything you want. But you went and you found another man's wife. And you took her to be your wife. And you had her husband killed. And because of that, God saw that. And it broke God's heart, David. And there's going to be consequences to your sin. And there's going to be bloodshed in the future. And as Nathan's saying this, David breaks down and starts weeping. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, God, against you and you alone have I sinned. And Nathan lifts David up as a pastor would do and comforts him and says, David, God loves you. He's always loved you. And because he loves you, that's why he's rebuking you. Now, sometimes in our Christian walk, we don't understand why we would get rebuked or corrected by God and assume that that's love. But just like a parent desires that his children or her children would grow up to make wise decisions. And so at a young age, they teach their children right and wrong and they correct them when they get it wrong and put them in time out or discipline them. It's because they love them. They care about their kids' future. And in the same way, God cares about your future so much so that when you miss it, God wants to make sure that you learn from that mistake and that you get better and you become who he's called you to be. And Nathan said, David, God loves you. God forgives you, but forgiveness doesn't cancel out all the consequences. There's still gonna be consequences, but you need to know that God's gonna keep you as king of Israel. He's gonna forgive you, he loves you, and he's gonna even bless you that your children and your children's children will be the future kings of Israel. And through your family, the Messiah will come. God loved David. And David had a moment where he missed it. All of us have moments where we miss it. Now, maybe you don't miss it the same way that David missed it, but maybe you've missed it in another way. And just like God sent Nathan to David, maybe God's sending me to you right now to just warn you and say, listen, stop going down that path. Stop trying to hide it. Stop trying to cover it up. God already sees it. Just bring it to God and let God cleanse you and let God forgive you. We're gonna see in this next moment of David's life, the decision that he makes and how it affects his future and how it can affect your future. So what can we learn from this point in David's life? Well, first off, we can learn to resist. Number one, resist. You and I have a formula for victory over temptation. God tells us in the Bible that there's no temptation that's too big for us to overcome. God always gives us a way out and he calls us to resist the devil. In the book of James, it says resist the devil and he must flee. It's not like resist the devil and he might flee, resist the devil and he'll think about fleeing. No, it says that when we resist the devil, he has to flee, which means that we have power in our prayer. We have power in our decisions that we can say, Satan, I see through the illusion of this temptation. I know you're trying to make it look pretty. You're dressing it up in a little skirt, trying to make me interested. But no, I know this moment of pleasure can cost me a long season in my life. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna get off track from the destiny that God has for me. So you know what, all of us, we have the opportunity to resist the devil and he has to flee. In the book of Judges, we see a man named Samson who was tempted time and time again by Delilah. And instead of resisting the devil, he kept entertaining that relationship. In, in the book of 2 Samuel, we see that Bathsheba, she wasn't even trying to seduce David, but David was the one who kept looking and lingering in that direction. Instead of resisting the devil, he kept entertaining that idea of lust, thinking if I can get what I know I shouldn't have, it'll somehow fix this problem inside of me. And lust never fixes any problems. In fact, lust only creates more problems. 
But there is a story in the Bible where this guy does resist the devil. And it's Joseph. And we see in the book of Genesis that Joseph is tempted by Potiphar's wife day and day and day and day that she keeps coming to him, trying to tempt him. And Joseph resists her and he flees. And the good news is Joseph never committed a sexual sin in his story. And God continued to bless him. Can God bless people who make mistakes, whether it's sexual sin or some other sin? Absolutely. God can still restore and can still forgive and can still show mercy and give people second chances. No doubt about it. God's a great God and he's bigger than our mistakes. But those mistakes cost us years of our life and they cause us to walk through seasons that God doesn't want us to have to walk through. So what if we can learn lessons from these people and choose to resist? Here's the second thing we can learn from David, repent. If you do not resist and you do fall into sin, the next best option for all of us is to repent. Don't keep going down that path. Don't repeat the sin, repent of the sin. Choose to say, Lord, I missed it. I am sorry, I need your forgiveness. And Lord, create in me a clean heart. I don't wanna keep repeating this sin, I wanna repent of it. To repent means to turn from your ways. A lot of people think repentance is just going down to an altar call, saying a prayer, saying I'm sorry, but then they go right back and they keep doing the same thing and the same thing. Real repentance to say, is to say, Lord, I'm changing who I am and I'm changing the way that I'm walking out my life. I'm gonna get on the right road. You can choose to repent today and realign where you're walking down and, and the choices that you're making. You have power over your decisions. The devil doesn't control what you do and what you don't do. You have power over the devil. He's not strong enough to control what you choose to do in that moment of temptation. And here's the last point right here, refocus. You know, I think about when I'm looking through the lens of a camera and it's off focus, everything's blurry and everything doesn't make sense. But then when I start to move the, the lens around and I'm able to focus in on whatever it is I'm supposed to focus on, it's the same way with our hearts. Sometimes, we get out of focus, we get distracted, whether it's by a temptation or by problems or circumstances, and we forget that God's still on the throne, God still loves us, God is still for us, God still has a plan for our lives, but we must refocus. Say it with me, refocus. Yes, you sound beautiful, Victory. Refocus. So today I'm challenging all of us, if you've gotten off focus, if you've been distracted by temptation or sin or guilt or shame, whatever it is, get your lens back into focus. And here's what I want you to refocus on. Refocus on God. Get your eyes back on Jesus. Get your eyes back on the Word of God. And get your eyes back on this fact right here. God is not finished with you yet. And He has a plan for your life. He wants to use you, even though you might have missed it, even though you might have failed, just like David, God can restore you. He can forgive you. He can reconcile you and he can get you refocused on the plan and the path that he's marked out for you. And I'm telling you, you're gonna live out your best days yet. So we come to the close of this chapter in David's life. Thankfully, it's not the end of his story. What's amazing is that God gives David many, many more years of his faithfulness and of allowing David to lead the nation of Israel and giving him victory over his enemies and allowing him to see even his own family members rise up and one of his children to succeed him as the next king of Israel. Why does God give David a second chance? Why would God give you and me a second chance? Because we serve a God of abundant mercy. We don't serve the God who says, you failed, you're out of here. No, we serve the God who says, you failed, come to me, repent. Let me give you mercy. Let me do a fresh work inside of you. Let me remind you that your best days are still in front of you. Let me remind you that as long as you're breathing, God's not finished with you yet. It says that in 2 Samuel 12, the child that David and Bathsheba had conceived died. Just days after his birth as a young baby boy, they lost their child. So here David was, he had gone to the temple of the Lord. He knew that was the only place to run. Where do you run when you don't know where else to go? Do you call up your ex? Do you go to the bottle? Do you find that drug, that pill? Do you go to another website? Where do you run when you feel so broken and empty? When you're searching for something to lean on, David ran to the presence of God. It says that after he washed his face and washed his hands, 
knowing that he had sinned, knowing that he lost this child, all because of his continual path into sin, that he went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. I can only imagine this worship service between David and God. No one else was there. It was the lowest point David had ever been in. And here he was in God's presence. Maybe he just began to sing these songs to the Lord. Search me, O oh God, and know my every thought. Renew my mind. Take my life. I'm all yours. And look inside my heart, remove every part that does not glorify you, Lord. I'm all yours, and I'm all yours, I'm all yours, every part of me in the heart of me is all yours with everything i have i'm holding nothing back i want your will have your way i'm all yours and i'm all yours i'm all yours every part of me in the heart of me is all yours. Lord, nothing but your blood can wash away our sins. God, we come to you in full surrender. We're all in, God. Do what you want to do in our hearts and in our lives. David prayed this prayer of complete surrender. He prayed the Psalm 51 prayer. Create in me a clean heart, God. Search me. You know the depths of my soul. You know where I've missed it. You knew that my motives were wrong, even in my mother's womb. But God, I'm asking you to start fresh in me. Give me a fresh start. And God did it. And if God did it for David 3,000 years ago, God could do it for you in this day and age. He can give you a fresh start in your marriage, a fresh start in whatever season of life you're in as a single, maybe you've been divorced, Maybe you're walking through a difficult season of life. Maybe it's your fault. Maybe it's other people's faults. Maybe there's sin inside you or maybe someone has sinned against you. But today, bring it to God. Let him do a fresh work in your heart. Let him restore inside of you the joy of your salvation. God blessed David and Bathsheba with another child and they named him Solomon. And it says in 2 Samuel 25 that the Lord loved Solomon and gave him a spiritual name, Jedidiah, which means friend of God. Solomon would become the next king of Israel. God had not forsaken David, that even in David's worst moment, even when David didn't deserve any mercy or forgiveness, God showed it to him. And if God showed it to David, God will show it to you. Even on your worst day, even when you've missed it so bad, God loves you, he's not against you, he's for you. He's a good God and he cares about your soul. And God didn't send his son to save your image. He sent his son to save your soul. And if you'll come to God and say, Lord, created me a clean heart. Just as David cried out in Psalm 51, after he had realized his big mistake, he said, Lord, against you and you alone have I sinned. And I desire for you to create in me a pure spirit, a steadfast heart. Lord, remove the sin that's deep inside my soul. Change me from the inside out. God, you don't require these burnt sacrifices. That's not what you delight in. Rather, you desire a broken spirit. So David said, Lord, here I am, a broken man with a broken heart, and I, 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 I recognize that I've sinned against you. And so, Lord, I ask for your forgiveness, and God gave it to him. I wanna lead us into a time right now of prayer. All over this room, I'm gonna ask you to just close your eyes and bow your heads. And I want you to just look deep inside your soul. And I want you to be honest with yourself because listen, things never change until we finally face who we are and we get honest and we get real with maybe what we've been hiding deep down inside. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and there's sin inside your heart, maybe there's secret sins that you've committed that you think no one else knows, but God knows. Maybe you're sitting there today and 
You've repented, but you've still been carrying around shame and guilt, and you don't know how to get free of this guilt. You don't know how to move forward from your past. God can give you freedom today. You don't have to keep living in the chains of shame. You can break out of the shackles of guilt. All you have to do is just come to the Lord with that broken heart and say, God, I'm ready to move forward. I'm ready to receive your forgiveness. We're gonna go into a time of worship. And before I ask you to respond to this, I wanna pray for you. And then out of this video, we're gonna have an opportunity for you to respond today during this worship song. But Lord, I pray for every person in the room who's searching deep in their hearts and souls. I pray, God, that today you would show them who you are and that you would show them that you're a good God, a faithful God, and a merciful God. And I pray, Lord, that people would have that same recognition that David had, that if there's sin in their heart, that sin needs to be dealt with and it needs to be repented of. And God, I thank you that as we come to you, don't, we don't come in a sense of fear or anger or, or shame. We come from a place of brokenness and we understand that you love us so much and you want to remove that, that sin and that guilt and that fear and shame out of our hearts. So Lord, I pray during this moment that those who need to make that decision will make it and that it'll be a fresh start in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.